for recording. Okay, so in terms of the writing the quiz, one of the comments was that the material, like it was too much, it was too long. My argument would be that based off of the results, while there may not have been a lot of time left over to say check over the marks, given how well students are doing, I would say that most of you are, I mean, a majority of you are, are, um, are understanding the material. I, at some point, um, I want to go over the ANOVA tables that started question five. Um, I, I suppose that actually I can just do that today. So I want, I want to go over the ANOVA tables that started question five, just so that we can all be a little more clear on how that would work. I do think that this is a trickier problem. I'm, I didn't go, I, I did, in my mind, I sort of knew that that was gonna be a sneakier type problem, but one of the, um, <clears throat> rea one of the things that I noticed when I was marking the quiz uh, was that students were doing calculation that they didn't have to do. So something to keep in mind going forward is that long calculations, like any kind of sum of square calculation, standard deviation calculation, even the calculation of an average in a situation where say that you have uh, more than like 10 data points or something like this, I wouldn't ask you to do this on a 50 minute quiz. I wouldn't even really ask you, I wouldn't ask you to do this on the final either. Uh, in my opinion, long calculation style questions are for assignments. So on the assignment, you will see these types of problems. I mean, on assignment four, we had the completely randomized block design where you had to work out the sum of squares calculations by hand. Most of you that did this, that probably took you quite a bit of time to do. If I ask you to do that kind of thing on a quiz, that would be the entire quiz. So there's no, reason for me to do that because I can't really assess understanding that way. So with that being said, one thing to keep in mind going into quiz three is I won't ask for that kind of calculation. So that hopefully will give you some idea of what to expect when you're writing the quiz. And what I just mean is like, if you're going through this process where you're like, this one calculation is taking me 10 minutes, probably shouldn't be doing that. The other thing is, um, the, the questions weren't always read carefully. So for example, the last question on the quiz asked you to find only the margin of error for the pairwise calculations, but I had students doing full pairwise comparisons of all of the means in the experiment. You know, that's a lot of extra work that has, isn't necessary. So that would also absorb a lot of time. In fairness, I do think that there were some questions that were a bit redundant in marking it. For example, um, <clears throat> there was one question that asked you to define a response variable and to define a treatment and then basically give an example of each. And then there was a follow-up question that basically said, define a contrast and give an example. A lot, quite a few students realized that they could do the exact same example for both of those problems, which was completely valid and there was nothing wrong. Like that was actually very smart in my opinion, because you, you know, you already thought of an example and now you can apply it directly to two questions for marks. But that's the kind of thing that going forward, I would I probably won't do again because it, there's no real purpose in me asking you to do the same thing twice, right? So in that sense, I agree that some of it was a bit redundant. Um, another thing on that topic, uh, actually, sorry, I lost my train of thought where I was going to go with that one, but okay. So let's talk about those ANOVA tables. I'm just going to give an example of how this would work, but I'm not going to use exactly the same numbers that were given in the, um, on the quiz. Okay. So these are going to be the ANOVA tables for each type of design. Okay, so this is uh, Q5.
Okay. Now, I wouldn't say that this particular part of question five was done really well across the majority of the exams. There were some students that did really well with this and it was great to see. Um, there were other students, of course, that struggled with the, that struggled with this. And I mean, that is also to be expected, but the, um, the reason that I bring that up is you know, you, it's, it can be stressful for a student when they're writing an exam and they see one question that's worth, I think question five is worth 21 marks. And you can look at the question and go, okay, this is not good because if I don't get this part, I can't get the next part, I can't get the next part. There were lots of students that got the ANOVA tables wrong but still did really well on the question. So even though it was linked, I didn't penalize you multiple times for the same mistake. So say you get the MSE wrong in the CRBD on on, in part B, but you report the right number according to your calculations in part C, I'm not gonna dock you marks twice for having the wrong number. I'll take one mark off for getting it wrong one time and that's it. And that's the same thing with the F test in part D of question five. There were lots of students that did the wrong test. So there were students that did, for example, the test about the block means when they were supposed to do the test about um, the treatment means. So I took a mark off because you started the test off incorrectly. But if every single part of the test was right, I didn't dock you full marks for doing the wrong test. So even though the questions are related, I, <laughs> I wouldn't destroy a, an entire... My point is just that you don't have to be as worried about questions being related in that sense. So I'm not going to take marks off multiple times for one mistake early on, is my point. So even if you don't get it right, right away, you just keep working through it. And as long as what you're doing is demonstrating you understand how to work through the processes, even if the numbers are incorrect, I can still mark you on your knowledge of how the material works. But if you don't do anything or don't show anything, there's no marks that I can give in that case. All right, now going back to this problem. Okay, so let's say, I need to give an example of data too. Okay, so we had a, a, rectang a rectangular data set, right? So let's just say, uh, well, I might as well just do it like this. Okay, so we had something looks like this, right? Now, the first part of the problem was identifying which part were the treatments, which part was the response, which part were the blocks. So our treatments were here, our blocks were therefore here. So we have five blocks, four treatments. So right off the start, these two numbers are gonna be the same. Inside the rectangle, you have all of the data points. So that means that you have 15 observations. So now the totals are also gonna be the same. So that means that left over here, you have 12. We have five blocks here, so this is a four, and left over you have eight. So that's the degree of freedom part done for the ANOVA table. Now there is two, one other part that was sneaky about this question. We were given a total value here. So let's just call this value uh, 10. Okay, whatever. Now, and we were also given a value here. Let's just call this value three. Okay, so the red parts were given to you. And then actually this was given a well. It's, as well, let's just call this one. I don't know if any of this math is gonna work out, but well, I probably won't now. So this is gonna to have to be a four, three. Okay, sure. All right, so this, this is how you would approach this. We talked about this when I introduced the completely randomized block design. The completely randomized block design is or shares the exact same goal as a one-way ANOVA. So they both want to do the same thing. The only difference is that the CRBD absorbs error. The result of this is that the total line, and actually this is true across any ANOVA, the total line is gonna be identical across all the experiments. So we were given a 10 here. So that means that we also have a 10 here. So those are the same. 
So from the one table, you get both totals. The other thing that is equivalent is the first three values for the treatment. So the treatments in both of them are going to have the same sum of square, the same degree of freedom, and the same MSE, which means that we now have a three here. Once you have that, everything else you can work out just using basic ANOVA calculations, right? So for example, here, this is going to be 1.5. This is going to be 1.5. Here, you're going to have a four because one times four is four. Okay. Um, you have a 10 down here, so that's got to be a seven. You've got a 10 down here. So this has to be a three. Then you have eight over three here. You have 12 over seven here. And then you can get the F statistics and that part's done. So that is how you would approach 5B. There's no long calculation required here. It's simply testing if you really understand how the designs are related. And again, there was quite a few students that actually did this part perfectly, which is great because I've been using this question for a long time and I've seen all kinds of results to it. Um, but it was really nice to see that understanding. But then in other cases, there were students that struggled on this part. But again, I wasn't going to penalize you multiple times for not being able to get this. So you don't have to be worried about that going forward on the next quiz or on the final or things like that. Okay, so that's the only part I really wanted to go over from 5B. For the most part, all the definition questions were handled really well. Anytime it asks for an example, it means like an, a real example. Um, Yeah, and then the other thing, again, just going back to the point I was trying to make before, you got to read the questions carefully because, again, on the hypothesis test, for example, it said test the treatment effect or test for a difference among treatment means. And some students were doing tests about the block means, right? So that's automatically going to be at least one mark off if you understand how to do the test because you're not doing the right test right off the start. Uh, okay, so does anyone have any... Uh, questions for me, I should get back. I should finish that lecture set today. So any quick questions? It's snowing very hard right now. Just when you think it's over. So much snow. All right, I'm not seeing any. Okay, so moving back into the lecture material. Okay, so we are March 8th. Oh, um, yeah, another big announcement. I, well, another announcement. So Q3 is gonna be March, 29th now. So that's the Friday instead of the Monday. The rationale for this was just in looking at the calendar. Um, there's an there's an lab assignment due on the 22nd anyways. We also have assignment five due the, on the 20, uh, on the 18th, I think it is. So the, the Friday before the original date. Uh, quite a bit of the material on Q3 will be related to that assignment. So it makes sense for you to have at least a week to review the solutions and whatnot to get ready for this. So um, also the 29th fits a little bit better into the assignment schedule moving forward. So that quiz has just been pushed to that 29th date. That'll be the last quiz. Um, yeah, 26, sorry. Sorry, thanks. The 29th would have been the Monday, right? Yeah, that was the other class. So the quiz three is on the 26th, right? Thanks. Uh, but the rationale, like I was saying, is the same. It's just, it kind of fits a little bit better into the schedule with the assignments and it'll give more time to review the assignment five solutions. Yeah, okay, so that's, okay, yeah. There shouldn't be anything else for 252 on that date. So there shouldn't be an assignment from either the lab or the lecture on that date. Okay, now the actual lecture material. Um, we can go through this fairly quickly. So we learned last week how to run a signed test or a signed rank test. 
The sign test and the sign rank test are alternatives to one sample t-tests, but they are also alternatives to paired t-tests. The reason why we can use it as an alternative to a paired t-test is because a paired t-test is essentially a two sample test, but it's run on one sample of data. So you take, for example, two, call, two variables on each measurement, you subtract all the measurements from each other to get a set of differences. And then you operate on the differences directly. So you can think of a paired t-test as really just being a one sample t-test, but it's working on a transformed uh, set of data points. So we can use the sign or the signed rank test as a non-parametric alternative to a paired t-test because we can just apply it to the differences directly. Okay. Now the way that the test will run, and we're gonna use the signed rank test because it's, um, as we talked about before, it's a more powerful alternative than the sign test. The way that the tests are run are identical to what we saw last class. So there's no change in how we will actually perform the signed rank test. The only difference is on step one, where we will now have hypotheses that are about the distributions of the data points, or sorry, about the differences between the medians rather than about the individual set of medians itself. So just like we saw when we ran two sample hypothesis tests back in lecture set number three, for the signed rank test on pair data, our hypotheses are going to be about a comparison between two medians. We can also write them as a comparison between the distributions themselves. And that's what capital D stands for. But you'll see that the hypotheses about comparing the medians or the hypotheses about comparing the distributions of the values, those are, they follow the same logic. So the way we set them up is exactly the same. Okay. So what does it mean when we talk about comparing the distributions? Well, essentially the idea is this. So suppose that we have Um, some axes that looks like this here, okay? Now let's say that we are com um, we're comparing two distributions. So it doesn't matter the shape of the distribution, but let's say that we have an example that looks like this. I'm sure, whatever this will be. So this will be D1. Okay. And then in the second example here, we have D2. Okay, so this is an example here. Okay, of D2 being greater than D1 on the axis that we're using. So basically what we're talking about when we talk about a comparison of distributions is the same thing that we're talking about when we talk about a comparison of the medians. Because we're talking about the centers directly, we're really just talking about a location shift in that distribution. So D2 being greater than D1 is the same thing as the center of D2 being larger than the center of Z1. Okay. And actually this can also be an example of D1 not equal to D2. And that just depends on how far apart the medians or the, the, the centers of each distribution are. If they're, for, if they're far enough apart, we could get rejection on the two-tail test and rejection on the one-tail test. But it might be the case that we get rejection on the one-tail but not on the two. It just depends on the separation and on the test statistic. Okay, so when we talk about a location shift, we really just mean the centers not being equal to one another or the distributions not sitting on top of each other. And again, for the um, pair t-test illustrations, we can write our hypotheses in terms of either the medians or in terms of the distributions, which we call capital D, and that it means the same thing. Okay, so let capital w, w donate the sum of the ranks of the positive differences and uh, capital W or 
negative, donate the sum of the rings of the negative differences. Okay, so how do we expect these things to behave in each of the different situations? Okay, so when the locations are the same, you'll basically expect, you'll expect the ranks of the positives and the negatives to be about equal. So if we have two distributions that are sitting effectively right on top of each other, we should observe an equal number or an equal sum of the negative ranks and the positive ranks. If D1 is less than D2, okay, so we'll, I think we need to define the Ws to be D2 minus D1 in order for this thing to work out. Let me just check my notes here to make sure I don't. Yeah, so let's just assume here that little d equals d1 minus d2. Okay, so um, okay, so if d1 is less than d2, then we should expect the sum of the negative ranks to be less than the sum of the positive ranks. And if D1 is greater than D2, then we should expect the sum of the positive ranks, yeah, to be greater than, or sorry, the sum of the negative ranks to be greater than the sum of the positive ranks. I need to think about this for a minute. Yeah, there we go. That makes way more sense. Okay. Yeah, so if we take the differences as being D1 minus D2, then D1 will be less than D2 if the sum of the negative ranks is greater than the sum of the positive ranks. Yeah, that makes sense. And then D1 will be greater than D2 if the sum of the positive ranks it's exceeds the sum of the negative ranks. Yeah. Okay, so let's see an example of this now. So <clears throat> to test the effect of a new pain relief medication developed to provide headache relief, a pharmaceutical company randomly selects 10 patients with similar conditions and asks each to randomly take one of either this new drug, which we call the red pill, or a vitamin, which we call the blue pill, um, during each of their next two migra migraine episodes. The patients were then asked to, to report their pain using a scale of one to 10 where a score of one indicates no pain and a score of 10 indicates extreme pain. The following measurements are the pain scores from the study. At the 5% significance level, do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude that the red pill is more effective in reducing drugs than the blue pill? Okay, so. All right. Yeah, okay, cool. Okay, so the way that this is going to work out, the first thing that we want to do is make sure that we clearly understand how we are measuring the pain tolerance and how we are measuring the difference. So pain is rated on a scale from one to 10. So the pain scale is saying one is minimal pain, 10 is extreme pain. So the higher the numbers, the more pain you are experiencing. We want to know if there is evidence that the red pill is more effective in reducing pain than the blue pill. Okay, so we will let A to one or D one be the blue pill scores. So let A to one B 
be um, blue pill pain scores. Let eta two or d two be red pill pain scores. Okay. Now we have taken the differences as being the blue score minus the red score. Okay. So we are going to expect if, um, if the blue, if the red pill reduces pain, these differences should be uh, greater than zero. Hey, does that make sense? Because we're doing blue minus red. So if the red pill reduces pain, the scores associated with the red pill should be lower than the scores associated with the blue pill, which means that you're subtracting a smaller number from a bigger number. So the differences should be larger than zero. Okay, so given the declarations then, we would have the following setup. So on step one, we would have H0, A to one, is less than or equal to a to two versus the alternative a to one is greater than a to two. Okay. And then this can be written in a number of other ways as well. So we can also write this as a to one minus a to two less than or equal to zero versus the alternative a to one minus a to two is greater than zero. Or we could have the D version. <laughs> so D1 less than or equal to D2 versus HA D1 greater than D2. Okay, so all three of these things mean the exact same thing. Okay, then on step two, we have our significance level. Okay, good stuff. Okay, now on step three, we need to construct our summed rank test statistic. So what we're gonna do here is exactly what we did in the pygmy sunfish example that we talked about on Friday, I believe. So we're gonna set up a table that allows us to calculate the differences with respect to the hypothesized median, which in this case is gonna be zero. So in the DI column, we're just going to list the differences that are given to us. So we'll have negative 1, 3, 0, negative 2, 2, 2, 2, 4, 4, 3. Okay, so we're going to have lots of ties to break here. Okay, then in the second column, we're going to have the capital DI which is gonna be di minus uh, a to zero, we'll call it in this case. Okay, so we're working, because it's a, a two sample test, we're working around a hypothesized value of zero. So our comparison this, in these cases are all with respect to a value of zero. So the capital di are gonna be exactly the same as the little di, because each of these is gonna just be di minus zero. So again, here we're gonna have like negative one minus zero equals negative one, three minus zero equals three. And then we'll just have zero, negative two, 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 four, four, three. Okay, now we have to take the absolute value of the di. So we'll have one, three, zero, two, 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 four, four, three. Okay, now we have to assign the ranks. Okay, so we rank from closest to the value, uh, from closest to the value to farthest from the value. Any value that ties is excluded from the comparison. So this is the same rule that we had before. So the zero here is gonna be excluded because it ties with the value that we're testing. Okay, so when we start ranking, we start off 
the distance of one is going to get rank one because that's the closest. Now we have a four way tie for second place. So the way that this is going to work is you take the four ranks that would be assigned to the four values, two, three, four, five. And then you take the average and assign, or you take, yeah, the average of two, three, four, five, and you assign that value as the rank. Okay, so for each of these, we're gonna have two plus three plus four plus five over four, which is equal to 3.5. So each of these twos gets a rank of 3.5. That's our tie breaking procedure. We then have two values that are tied for sixth place. So those would get rank six and seven. So here we're gonna have six plus seven over two, which is 6.5. And here we're gonna have six plus seven over two, which is 6.5, okay? And then we have two values tied for eighth and ninth. So the same idea here. So these are gonna get four plus nine over two, sorry, eight plus nine over two, which is 8.5. Okay, and then the last thing is we just have to take our signs. Okay, so this is a negative, positive, negative, positive, 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 positive. So our test statistic for this example is gonna be the sum of the positive ranks. So we're gonna have from the previous table, W0 is equal to 6.5 plus 3.5 plus 3.5 plus 3.5 plus 8.5 plus 8.5 plus 6.5, which is 40.5. So you can see this is working exactly the same as it did uh, when we first introduced the test in the one sample case. The only difference is that we're operating on the differences now rather than on the raw data directly. And our hypothesized median is the difference, or is the hypothesized difference, which is just a value of zero in this case. Okay, so now we can take either the critical value approach or the p-value approach. Okay, so just like before, this is gonna be zero, this is gonna be zero. The value here is gonna be um, nine times 10 over two. So N times N plus one over two, which is 45. Same thing here, 45, all right. We're testing at the 5% significance level. So let's say that um, we'll just sketch these two, for example. All right, so we're gonna have W alpha, which is W 0 0.05. Okay, so we go to our Wilcoxon table. We have a sample size of nine in this case because we excluded the one value. So that gives us a critical value of 37. And then all we have left to do is mark down where our test statistic is. So let's say that that's right about here. Okay. 
then if we take our p-value approach, okay, we start by marking down our test statistic. Okay, so here we're gonna have the p-value is equal to the probability that W exceeds 40.5. All right, so we go back to our Wilcoxon table. We have a sample size of nine. And we can see that 40.5 sits right here. So we are in between 39 and 42. So the p-value in this case is going to be between 0 0.025 and 0 0.01. Okay, so since 0 0.01 is less than the probability is less than 0 0.025, the p-value is less than 0 0.025, which is greater than 0 0.1. Okay, so we can reject the null. And then on step six, we can say at the 5% significance level, the data provide sufficient evidence to suggest that um, the, and there's actually a couple of different, there's two ways that we can write the conclusion. So we can do the conclusion in terms of the population median. So we could just say the median pain score on the blue pill or the median pain score on the red pill is less than the median pain score on the blue pill. Or we could write, there's evidence that the population um, of pain scores for those people that take the blue pill is has a higher center than the population of the p value of the pain scores for the people that take the red pill. Probably the medians is a little clearer than that. So we'll just do it that way um, to suggest that the median pain score on the red pill is less than that of the blue pill, all right? And now we have an example of how to run the sign rank test for paired data, which is, which is good. Okay, um, any questions? Are you sure? One, two, three, three point fives. One of them is negative. Yeah, only add the ranks that have a positive sign. Any other questions? All right, so uh, that brings us to the end of the discussion on the signed rank test. So again, the sign test and the sign rank test are both can both be used in the same place. 
The advantage of the signed rank test is that it doesn't throw away information like the sign test does. So the sign test only uses the sign of the value with respect to the hypothesized uh, median. The signed rank test uses the sign and the rank of the value. Okay, so it uses extra information that you get from the same data without um, adding strict distributional assumptions to the data or to the, to the process. The next procedure that we're gonna talk about, which is the focus of lecture set 10, is the Wilcoxon rank sum test. The rank sum test is our alternative to a two sample, an independent two sample t-test. Okay, so again, like so far we have sign test slash signed rank test. And this is one sample test or paired test. Okay, now we have the rank sum test, and this is our alternative to the independent two sample test. All right, so we've this is going to be our third non-parametric approach, and it's an alternative to another one of the parametric types of tests that we studied in this lecture set, in particular the independent uh, two sample test. The Wilcoxon ring sum test goes by many names, as you can see on the slide. It's also known as the Man Whitney Wilcoxon test, the Man Whitney, the Wilcoxon Man Whitney test, and the Man Whitney U test. This name here, the Man Whitney U test, I think that's what it's called in SPSS, and I might be wrong about that, but th that is a name that gets thrown around a lot is that U test. Same thing. So it has a lot of different um, uh, names in the literature. Okay, the purpose of the rank sum test, again, is pretty much the same as the other non-parametric tests that we've seen so far. Basically, we're going to utilize the ranks of the data that we're working with to determine if there's evidence that the median of one population is different from greater than or less than the median of another population. So on slide three, we have a bit of a motivating example, I suppose. We're gonna come back to talk more about this data in a little bit, but the idea here is that you have the salaries of professors from um, universities separated by gender. And you wanna to check to see if there's a difference in, um, let's say the center of the distribution of salaries for the men and the women in this illustration, in these populations. Salary is a well-known example of right skewed data. So the majority of people work at lower salaries and then there's a few people that work at much higher salaries so that creates natural right skewness in the distributions so you can assume that the distributions for the male and the female salaries are not going to be normal and therefore that an independent t-test for example would not be appropriate because that normality assumption will most likely not be um, intact okay so as i said before as a result of the lack of normality, we need some way of testing for a difference between these two populations without having to use that assumption. So that's where the Wilcoxon rank sum test comes into play. So we have two independent samples and we want to test for a difference between these two independent populations. So that's where why, and we don't have, or we can't verify normality. So that's where the Wilcoxon rank sum test would be utilized. Okay, the rank sum test is going to act just like any other test that we have seen so far. So the assumptions for the test are we have an SRS that the populations or the samples are independent and that the two populations have similar shapes. Okay, so they don't have to be normal bell curves, but they should be similar enough. And the reason is because the differences between two similar shapes will be approximately symmetrical. For this uh, test, the composition of the test is again, six steps. On step three, we take the sum of the ranks for sample one. So we have to declare one of the populations as being population one and the other population or sample as being population two or sample two. And then of course that declaration will affect the alternative in the case that it's not a two-sided test. 
On step four, we can use either the critical value or the p-value approach. But in this case, we're going to be using a table that's a function of both sample sizes. So that's the second Wilcoxon sum rank table that's shown here. Now, just like with the other tests that we have seen, we will study a normal approximation for this particular approach. You can see here that we have very limited cutoffs. So you need a sample size of, say, 10 up to 10. So once you get beyond 10 in other population, you need an approximation because otherwise you have to round down with the table. All right, so we're going to look at how that table is going to work pretty much the same way as an ANOVA table, uh, but we'll take some example. We'll take a better look at it next class. Um, and on Wednesday as well, when we're working through the steps of the test, we'll also talk a little bit about that idea of location shift again, and we'll see um, a full example of how the test would unfold. All right, so again, we have three non-parametric tests, each one being an alternative to the test uh, to one of the parametric tests that we studied before. We're going to see a full example of the rank sum test on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we're going to see, most likely, we're going to see an example of what's called the Kruskal-Wallis test. And the Kruskal-Wallis test is our non-parametric one-way ANOVA. Okay, so we're basically just doing one non-parametric test for each of the first four procedures that we talked about in the class. All right, so I'll stop there for today. And if you guys have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, I will talk to you on Wednesday afternoon.